Welcome to Beyond the Horizon podcast, a show all about the Horizon ecosystem and the exciting world of blockchain and Web3. Join us as we explore the latest happenings in this rapidly evolving space and discover new horizons together. Now let's go Beyond the Horizon. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Beyond the Horizon. Today's episode is going to be heavily focused on zero knowledge cryptography. We're going to be welcoming on two of our team members to discuss. They've both been around the ZK space for a while, as well as part of the HL team. We look forward to welcoming them on. But before that, let's go ahead and get into the news. Over the past month, we've been very excited to announce partnerships for Horizon Eon, our EVM-compatible sidechain. Some of these partnerships include Anchor. As you all know, uh, Anchor is a massive node infrastructure provider that focuses on providing infrastructure for blockchains, especially focused on enterprises. And as you all may know, we also welcomed Oros into the Horizon Fold. They'll be providing market-making services, ensuring that Eon is able to provide the liquidity that everyone will need when they come and start developing and utilizing smart contracts and dApps on our new sidechain. So we're super excited to welcome them into the ecosystem as partners. We also want to remind you that the upcoming deprecation of main chain shielded pools is right around the corner. This means that Horizon or Zen will no longer be a privacy token. Instead, we'll be focusing more on a utility-based privacy options through applications rather than tokens. So we're super excited about that. If you have any questions about any of the announcements this month, feel free to check out horizon.io slash news or join us on Discord. Hey everyone, welcome back to Beyond the Horizon. Today we're welcoming Marcus and Serena from our cryptography team. So we're very excited to get into more about what Horizon uses cryptography for. But first, I'd love for them to introduce themselves. Uh, so let's go ahead. Marcus, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi. So thanks for having me. Um, I'm one of the cryptographers at Horizon Labs. And essentially, that's uh, I've been doing a PhD in cryptography for five years, four years. And that's my first industry job. And uh, I've started with legacy stuff like block ciphers, hash, hash functions, and so on. And well, now I'm continuing this work, but in a more modern uh, atmosphere because uh, zero knowledge stuff and so on is a bit different than what we did like 20 years ago. And so, yeah, I'm here at Horizon Labs. So I'm very happy to continue this journey. Amazing. And we're excited to have you as well. Uh, Serena, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, uh, I'm a product manager here at Horizon Labs for the cryptography team. Um, at large, I mainly prioritize the work that our cryptography team is working on um, and looking for use cases and problems to solve. Very cool. Um, so I know that a lot of people will be kind of interested to learn more about what a day in the life of somebody who works in cryptography looks like. Uh, Marcus, could you tell us more about what your day-to-day -day would look like? Mm, yeah, sure. So usually I try to get up very early because that's like a habit from PhD days, I guess. And Austrians usually like to work early in the morning. Um, so yeah, then I have a cup of coffee, of course. And uh, and then there are various activities which depend on, on the tasks at hand, of course. So for example, sometimes it's just reading papers, which seems maybe boring or like doing nothing. But I think that's uh, very important because you need to know like uh, what others do and not copy them, but maybe take inspiration. <laughs> um, and yeah, sometimes it's also writing papers uh, like recently uh, or sometimes it's even like uh, assisting uh, other team members or like uh, uh, doing some implementation work, which I'm usually not very good at, but I try my best. Um, yeah, so these are the tasks essentially. Okay, so you heard it here first. If you like reading, writing, and drinking coffee, cryptography is maybe for you. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, so let's get more into kind of uh, how Horizon uses cryptography. Uh, are you guys maybe, maybe able to speak to the benefits of using cryptography in a blockchain ecosystem? Um, yeah, so I can start, I guess. So. Um... When we talk about also like older blockchain systems like Bitcoin, uh, so the underlying component is always, uh, for example, a hash function. 
Uh, this is a very old primitive in cryptography that existed already many, many years ago and now also used in blockchains. Um, but that's different today, of course, also uh, the way we use uh, we use a blockchain or other blockchain is like Zcash or, so, or something like that. Uh, so what they do or what we also do is essentially use the hash functions in a different context because we like to prove something in zero knowledge. And, and the cool thing about that is that uh, many operations which are very expensive on, on the original concept of a blockchain are much more efficient uh, in, this new, in this new world, so to say. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for, for helping kind of clarify that question for some of our community members. Another thing um, that we wanted to talk about while we have you guys today, we know that the Horizon and Horizon Labs teams have a pretty deep history with and have always focused on cryptography. Can you maybe share some of the interesting use cases that you're currently working on with us? Um, our career team is split between like cryptographers, which Marcus obviously is doing cutting edge research on, um, and cryptographic engineers, which then takes the cryptographic research that exists or is um, being researched on currently and putting them into applications. So Marcus could probably speak to you a little bit more about the research he's been doing at a high level, um, and I can maybe do a quick dive into the applications and um, products that we're actually making. Yeah, that'd be great. So yeah, I was I was already talking about those hash functions before. Um, so the thing about hash functions is that uh, they already exist since many years, so we can just use some of the existing ones. But um, in the in the context of these uh, zero knowledge use cases, uh, it's uh, like many many other things are more important than just plain performance, for example. Because like ten or twenty years ago, when we designed a hash function, we only cared about maybe energy efficiency on hardware, but also like plain performance. Um, but the way these proof systems work, they are very depending on, on, other, on other properties of a hash function. And what I have been doing in the last couple of years, and I started with uh, my work on Poseidon, which is now used in many, many blockchains, uh, is that essentially um, other properties, like for example, a low degree in some components, a mathematical degree is much more important than just the plane performance. And that's what I'm also continuing with uh, with the other hash functions I'm currently working on. So for example, there's uh, one which is now called RC64. It will maybe be called differently when it's, uh, when it's published. Um, but essentially, it, it takes some newer concepts in this area of proof systems and tries to be, again, more efficient and, and, and faster than, than the previous ones, like, for example, Poseidon. Um, and then just speaking to you a little bit more about the applications. So um, some projects that our team has been working on, one is enabling private voting, um, especially in like EVM contexts. So right now we're working on developing a cryptographic extension of a very popular open source voting contract that would enable um, cryptographically for um, voters to actually hide their votes. And so I think this has huge impacts on like maybe DAOs or any future um, blockchain based voting systems. Um, another product that we've been working on is kind of investigating and seeing what applications we can incorporate decentralized identity solutions to. Um, so that's, I think, the bigger craze in the blockchain space. Um, and now we're just investigating how we can incorporate that technology in like everyday applications. Um, and third, we're kind of looking into how we can, um, I guess, expand our cryptographic expertise into everyday developers. So um, looking into, you know, maybe creating a easy to use developer friendly API library that wraps a bunch of different cryptographic functions so that um, a developer who may not be necessarily um, knowledgeable about cryptography can use cryptography in their applications as well. Wow, that sounds incredible, especially uh, the private voting tool that you guys are working on. It sounds like it'll be something that's really useful for a lot of different DAOs and projects that are in the space right now. And I know, Marcus, you had actually mentioned uh, Poseidon uh, a couple of minutes ago, but uh, I know that you have co-authored two different scientific papers uh, recently, Poseidon being one of them. Could you maybe tell us a bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So um, w w when when I'm designing a new hash function, I say it's uh, most people think it's uh, yet another hash function. Why do we even need that? Um, so um, and it's true, there are many hash functions out there. Um, but the thing is that uh, when we designed Poseidon, I think it was in 2018 when we started with the first concepts so like many years ago 
um, we weren't so aware of what a zero knowledge proof system actually needs from a hash function. It was a lot better than like classical hash functions like SHA2, SHA3 and so on. But there are many things which simply neglected because we didn't think it's so important. For example, the plane performance. It's Poseidon is not, it's faster than others, but it's not really like very fast. Um, and uh, then in the couple, in the next couple of years, the, the, there was a rise also in, in, in new, in new zero knowledge proof systems, and some of those uh, use like different components for the proofs and so on. So it was possible to design hash functions in a different way, or even to make like different trade-offs. For example, to design some hash function which is uh, much better in the proof system, but which has like slightly worse plane performance. Um, and this is one of the papers which got accepted now at Crypto 2023. Uh, so essentially this Griffin hash function is uh, worse than Poseidon when it comes to plane performance. But in some proof systems, it's uh, much better than Poseidon because it, for example, it uses uh, fewer constraints and is more efficient. And uh, for example, it's also used in this Winterfell library from Facebook currently. Um, yeah, so that's that's one of the one of the papers. The other is uh, Poseidon 2, which is, I'd say, a bit simpler. Uh, because it's just an extension to Poseidon in order to make actually the plane performance even better without changing, uh, we, so without changing a lot about the Poseidon itself. Uh, so these are the two directions essentially of those papers. Very cool. And just a random question for you, just because I'm personally curious. Could you tell me how the names are determined for these different functions? Poseidon is such a cool name. I'm just always so curious how that happens. Um, okay, so that's an interesting one. Yeah, so Poseidon actually does make, actually doesn't make a lot of sense, but okay. So the, when you, when you, when you draw the structure of the, of the permutation, which is uh, used inside of, of the cryptographic permutation, which is used inside the hash function, you get something like uh, a, a bifork because yeah, you have uh, something full in the beginning, something full in the end, and then like a line uh, connecting those two. Um, and this bifog is usually the weapon from, from Hades, I think, in mythology. So uh, the original design was actually called Hades, but we published already a block cipher, which is called Hades. So we just used Poseidon, which doesn't make a lot of sense because he uses a trifork, but that's the name. Yeah. And for the other names, which don't make a sense at all, it's usually one of the authors who has a very strong opinion about the name and the other authors saying, no, we don't have a strong opinion. Take whatever name works for you. And then that's the name. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that is too funny. Makes sense. Um, maybe not so much about the Poseidon one, but uh, I love that. I appreciate you giving me a little bit of the the history of how things are named. It's one of the things that I'm really excited about personally is naming stuff. So love it. Um, one question uh, that I know that a lot of people probably wonder about um and I'm going to end up asking both of you this because I know that you'll both have different opinions on it. Um, but we'll go ahead and start with Serena since um, I feel like we haven't lobbed you too many questions yet, Serena. Um, what is one thing about cryptography that you feel is really misunderstood? Oh, that's a, that's a hefty question. Um, I would say I think it's, people often think it's more complex than it actually is. Um, and that's maybe like unattainable or I guess, yeah, unattainable to an everyday developer. Um, so I think that's something that we're currently working on to make sure that like, Hey, like here is some, um, here's an educational aspect of like how you could potentially use cryptography in your application today. And here's a way that you can easily implement it. So I think that's one of the, being the, the misconception there of being really hard to implement. That, that's incredible. I, I really appreciate that take uh, because it is definitely something that I've always thought is like this crazy, insane, unattainable, difficult, un, un-understandable thing. Um, so thank you for sharing that opinion with us. Um, Marcus, your turn. What is something that you think is a bit misunderstood about cryptography? Um, yeah, so it's actually something I've thought about maybe half a year ago, the first time. Uh, so when you first like ask people what is cryptography, I, I think the, the 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 first answer you get is like making things secure, right, or making things private. Um, and that was certainly the case thousands of years ago when like uh, Caesar encrypted ciphertext for his army in in Europe, um, and so on. So there's even a Caesar cipher which is called for, by that. Um, 
But I think change, things have changed dramatically in the last 10, 20 years, uh, 30 years even, because we now have a pretty good understanding of how to make things secure or private. So we know mostly how to design block ciphers, how to design hash functions, and how to do the things even with zero knowledge. We, we mostly know how to make those secure. Of course, there are some errors which we don't know so 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 well yet. And sometimes we make some mistakes and there are some attacks. But for most cases, we know how to make things secure. So I think the the the, the major part or the art of cryptography today is to make things secure, of course, but also to make them fast. So to find that perfect trade-off between being more efficient, but providing the same security as some slower primitive, for example. I think that's uh, so optimizing, making things faster while still maintaining the security level is, I think, today the most important thing in cryptography. That's also a really good take. And honestly, this entire podcast episode has been massively educational for me personally. So I'm excited to share it with the community. I think there's going to be a lot of really great information for everyone on this. So we are officially at our last question. And it's something that I love to ask everybody. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Marcus. Um, what is something that you are most excited about in the next few months? I'm so very I'm very excited about the Eon launch. I've not worked on that, uh, but I'm excited to see what what others at Horizon Labs are doing and uh, about the results and the outcome and so on. I'm very interested in that. Um, cryptography wise, I'd say that the field is very dynamic, uh, but I feel that uh, that zero knowledge cryptography as a whole has much more use cases than only in in uh, in blockchain. Maybe it's not so clear to us now, but I guess. Uh, this will change in the next maybe five to ten years. Uh, so I'm very excited about that also. Yeah. Okay, Serena, your turn. <laughs> I was going to echo what Marcus mentioned. Um, so the launch of Eon, which is huge. Um, it's our first EVM compatible chain. And it's really, we've been spending the past few months um, like upgrading the developer tools, the user experience, and thinking of how ways that we can um, incorporate cryptography into like dots on our EVM. Um, so I think it's it's big and we're excited on streamlining experience um, for both developers and users of the Horizon ecosystem and are excited to kind of open the doors to many new members. Great answers, both of you. I'm also super excited about the launch of Eon as somebody who's been working pretty closely on on partnerships for it. I think it is going to be an amazing uh, launch for everyone. Um, so that brings us to the end of our episode here. Thank you both so, so much for joining us today. It's been a huge pleasure and massively educational. Um, and as many of you know, we'll be back next month with a completely different episode. Uh, so thank you both and see you guys again soon. Thank you very thank much you for having me. And that is it for episode number six of Beyond the Horizon. Again, we will be back next month with an exciting new topic. If you have any recommendations for an episode that you would like to see, feel free to send the recommendations either in comments below or via socials. We're happy to get ideas from everybody. Thank you all so much and we'll see you again soon. Thank you for joining us on Beyond the Horizon. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes as we continue to discover the limitless potential of the Horizon ecosystem. If you liked this episode, make sure to subscribe and leave a thumbs up. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time.